everyone. This is our first attempt at morning program for adults, so I'm glad somebody got the message. And I did, and thank you for the wake-up call this morning. <laughs> yes. Right, I appreciate that. Uh. So I see many familiar faces here, so I'm not sure how much of an introduction I need to give. Um, but Gary Highlander has been um, a guest here at Norfolk many times. Um, he is a history professor from Stonehill College and received his PhD from Boston, Boston College. College. They even let me in. <laughs> right. Boston College, and now alums have to give 150 hours of community service. Wow. Did you know that? I didn't get that memo. They just uh, they uh, just I got the dress code yeah. memo to make sure that we blend, but I, I haven't received that. Do we have to pay more taxes? No. All right, okay. More taxes, but 150 hours of community service. Wow, wow. I thought you had to go to prison to earn that privilege. No. Uh, no. Uh. So I'll turn it over thank to you. Gary. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning. Good morning, and please, thank you. Good morning, and please spread the word that, what do we have? Do we have three? Uh, uh, presentation? Four. We have four. All right, we have four presentations, and, and this being an election year, you know, that we thought it would be of interest to focus on and to feature a number of elections. And, and, and back in 1860, the election of 1860, and we know it, we know it today, they did know it at the time, that I mean, it, it led to the war between the states. It led to the, the war of northern aggression. But in Massachusetts, we can safely call it the Civil War. Remember, once you go below the Mason-Dixon line, it's the war between the states, and if you're well below the Mason-Dixon line, it's the war of northern aggression, isn't it? You know, that my guy, I'm from Illinois, you know, the land of Lincoln, you know, that my guy went after the South and attacked Fort Sumter and brought that war on. At least that's the story in Alabama and Mississippi. But in Massachusetts, it's a different story. And in 1860, Lincoln carried Massachusetts by 61 or 63 percent of the percent of the vote. So it was a clear win for the Republican Party, a clear win for the Lincoln for the Lincoln Hamlin ticket. And when's the last time you heard the name Hannibal Hamlin? You have not, have you? And in Han in Hamlin, Maine, you blink, you're through it. There's a general store, a gas station, and a and a stop sign, and then you're gone. So let's see if we can let's see if we can frame you know, the election of, 18, of 1860 here this morning. And we'll, we'll chat it up afterwards as well. And it's going to lead to a civil war. People knew, folks knew in 1860 that there was a great deal of talk, hot talk, in uppercase, about secession. That if Lincoln wins the election, that states will leave the Union, that they no longer felt safe in, in a nation. Certainly, they believed that the Republican Party and Lincoln was going to abolish slavery. You know, that Lincoln was an abolitionist. He was not, and I'll come back and, and deliver on this a little bit further. Lincoln was not an abolitionist. The Republican Party was not an abolitionist party at all. But perception is more important than the truth many times. And the perception is, among many Southern voters, certainly Southern slaveholders, that Lincoln, once he was elected, that he was lying about his promise not to go after slavery, and once he had the power of the presidency behind him and was duly elected, that he would move against slavery. And with his election in November of 1860, the state of South Carolina was the first one out of the Union. And who's with us? Because we do not believe Lincoln, that Lincoln really is Abraham Africanus, I love that phrase, Abraham Africanus, and that he will move to abolish slavery as soon as he's sworn in and that Republican Congress is with him. So let's see if we can bring, let's see if we can bring that election and blend it with the secession crisis of the winter of 1860 and, uh, and, and 1861. Abraham Lincoln, in, in 1856, so let's start the Let's start it here. And it's all about the electoral vote, as it is today. It's all about the magic number, isn't it? It's all about today, it's 270 electoral votes. And what we really will be looking at in 2012, and we have for many, many years, is we have, a, we have an election in which the election, in which we have a, a chase for 50, 50 states with a certain combination of electoral votes. 
and the magic number being 270. Today, in 19, in 1860 rather, the magic number, all right, the magic number was 152. So not that we need to know those numbers. And I never, ever ask my students to remember things like that or dates. I mean, you, you don't need me for a date as long as you have a sense of chronology. And I always like to share this with folks and it drives my students nuts. I tell them there is one date that you have to remember during this semester. There is one date and it's my birthday. <laughs> All right? And then I tell them I'm registered at Shreve, Crump and Lowe and Toys R Us, which really freaks them out to try to figure that out. So then we go from there, you know, once I've got their brains a little rattled up. So, and so the magic number here is 152. In 1856, the Republican Party, the brand new Republican Party, the Republican Party ran its first national election in 1856. And at the top of the ticket was John C. Fremont. And he had a great campaign slogan. He had a great rally slogan. Free soil, free men, Fremont. Don't you like that? Can't you imagine the convention cheering, free soil, free men, Fremont. And by free soil and free men, what the Republican position on slavery was, and it's encapsulated in that slogan, is that the territories be closed to slavery. That we are not going to interfere with slavery where it presently exists. It simply is not going to expand any farther into the territories. That slave labor denigrates and diminishes free labor. And that free labor is far more productive and economically resourceful and, and useful than slave labor. So that's the position of the Republican Party, that's the position of Lincoln in 1860, to contain slavery to the 15 slave states, and that over time slavery will wither on the vine when two things happen, and in no special order. One, that the, econ that the economic benefits of free labor are far more obvious over time than slave labor, far more productive, and secondly, that the moral issue of stealing somebody's labor and their lives will finally, will finally carry the day in the slave states, and Lincoln believing that it would begin in Virginia you know, and Kentucky where slavery was weakening. Over time, it will expire, and the best way for it to expire would be when the slave states and their legislatures, one by one, abolish slavery, that it would not come from the federal government, that it would be done state by state, slave state by slave state. And we all know how it is, that when you make your own decision and you have ownership of that decision, it's far more authentic, isn't it? That we made the decision in the state of Virginia, if you will, to abolish slavery. And Lincoln hoped over time it would begin to snowball, you know, through the other slave states beginning Kentucky and Virginia. And Lincoln was asked, when do you think slavery will finally end across the country? He said, maybe not until the early 19th century. It's going to take time. But if the states, one by one, have ownership of that decision, they're, they're, they're far more willing to embrace that decision and because they've made it rather than having it forced on them. And, we're, and I think we all subscribe to that, don't we? When you make the call, rather than having it forced on you, that's a very different decision. That's the position of Lincoln. That's the position of the Republican Party. In 1856, Fremont gets beat, and he gets beat by the Democrats. He gets beat by, by Buchanan, James Buchanan. And this will win you some money on a quiz show. And all, all I need is a shout out. It's on Jeopardy. The final answer is, who is James, Buchan James Buchanan? The question is, who was the only president who was a bachelor president? And the answer is, who was James Buchanan? And Mary Todd Lincoln, when she got a look at the White House, wow, she said, it looks like a bachelor lived here. And she was right. And that's a whole other story for another time, talking about Mary Lincoln and her Confederate counterpart, Virginia, uh, Virginia, da um, Virginia Davis, First Lady of the, Conf of, the, of the Confederacy. So that being said, in 1856, the Republicans get beat. But there's a silver lining in that defeat. And the silver lining is this. And the leaders of the Republican Party, in the day after and the weeks following the election, did a careful 
autopsy, a, a careful reading of the election returns. It sounds so contemporary. And here was their, and here was their analysis of the election returns. If in 1860 we can hold our base, that sounds very contemporary, doesn't it? If we can hold our base, the 11 states that we carried in 1856, if we can hold that base and then add to it Pennsylvania, and Pennsylvania is where James Buchanan was from, and James Buchanan was not going to run for re-election. Everybody knew that. And he was hard of hearing. He fell asleep at meetings. He was losing his vision. Uh, he had, was suffering from edema. He was one and out. And if we can carry Pennsylvania with, with a protective tariff to protect the iron industry or the burgeoning, yeah, the iron industry in Pennsylvania and then add to Pennsylvania. We've got 11, hold our base, add Pennsylvania, and then add either Indiana or Illinois. We can carry the entire election without having to win a single electoral vote in the South. So here is the post-mortem the day after 1856. Hold the base, add Pennsylvania, and then showcase the party on the frontier, pull in some frontier votes, carrying either Indiana or Illinois. And we know Abraham Lincoln is going to be the long shot nominee in 1860. And the Republican Party had already made the decision that we are going to have the convention in Illinois. And we know that, that I mean, there was a reason why the Republican convention was in Tampa in Florida to carry Florida, and there was a reason why the Democratic Convention was in North Carolina in the hopes of showcasing the party, spending a lot of money in the state of North Carolina, a swing state, cobbling together the right combination of states for 270. Some things never change. So we're taking the convention to Chicago, we're going to showcase the party, and we are going to book out the brand new convention site that's being built in Chicago. It's called the Wigwam. Terrific, it's on the frontier, the Wigwam, to showcase the party, to showcase who we are, and to see if we can pull in Midwestern votes. Illinois was a frontier town, a frontier state, still in 1860. And waiting there is Abraham Lincoln, who was well known, you know, well known across the state of Illinois. He had just been defeated for the Senate seat, you know, running, running against Stephen Douglas. And as Lincoln said, and as Mary Todd Lincoln said, the taste is in my mouth a little. Mary Todd Lincoln, Mary Todd Lincoln married, she married Lincoln for love, but she always, she also married, she married his heart, but she also married his ambition. And she was just as ambitious for Abraham Lincoln as he was for himself. And she was his tailwind, pushing, pushing, pushing. She wanted a reputation, she wanted to be known, Abraham Lincoln, wanted a reputation, he wanted to be known. And the taste is in my mouth a little bit. And when the delegates gathered at, in Chicago at the Wigwam, Lincoln had his supporters on the, on the floor working the delegations. They were called the Wide Awakes. Lincoln was not there. Lincoln's in Springfield, he's home. But keeping in touch that how were things going on the floor? And I wanna come back to that because before the Republican Party gathers, the Democrats have gathered. And boy, oh boy, did they ever have a doozy of a convention. And their convention imploded. And when the Republican Party met, they knew that this, could, this election was theirs to win. That they, are, they, ha they had it won. They just had to be careful. They had it won. What happened at the Democratic Convention in, in 1860 in Charleston, South Carolina, the very seat of secession. They could not have chosen a worse city than Charleston, South Carolina. It's a beautiful city to visit today. But in 1860, in uppercase, people were shouting, these were the fire eaters, secession, secession, secession. We hope that we lose this election because if we do, we now have to make a decision to remain and, and be abolitionized or to get out and to form our own nation once again, the Confederate States of America, just like our grandfathers had in 1776 when they declared their independency from the tyrant 
George III, and now we have King Abraham Lincoln I, Abraham Africanus, we gotta get out. We wanna lose this election. These were some of the fire readers. And this is what Stephen Douglas was up against. Stephen Douglas, a Democrat, going into Charleston, South Carolina, expecting the nomination. He was the front runner. And at that Democratic convention, he told the delegates, you cannot carry the country. You cannot win a national election by supporting the Dred Scott decision, which Justice Taney had ruled in a seven to two decision that slavery can, it can go into the territories, that the people of a territory may not forbid it, the Congress may not forbid it, slaves are property, and that the territories are open to slaveholders and non-slaveholders as well. And this is Stephen Douglas from Illinois telling the delegates at, in the, de at the Democratic Party, you cannot carry a national election. Talking about slavery going national. You cannot do that. And he was hooted down, howled down, heckled down. He was the front runner. He expected the nomination. And the whole convention broke up everybody tipping over chairs, tipping over tables, the fire readers storming out that under no circumstances will that man get the nomination, under no circumstances. And in that brouhaha, I can't spell that, but I like to use that word. In, in, that, in that implosion in Charleston, South Carolina, everyone agreed, okay, we, we, this is out of control here, shut the cameras down, and we're going to reconvene in Baltimore and see if we can get a nominee in Baltimore. So let's, come, but let's, let's continue with that. In Baltimore, when the party reconvenes, there, there is another implosion, and there is a split in the Democratic Party. Now imagine this. I mean, imagine as if there, if there had been a split in the Democratic Party in 2008, and half the candidates walked, in and walked out and nominated Hillary Clinton and the other half of the delegates walked out and nom nominated Barack Obama. That's the very thing that happened in Baltimore in 1860. There was a split in the party. The northern wing of the Democratic Party nominated Stephen Douglas of Illinois. The southern wing of the Democratic Party walked out, all right, and they nominated Breckinridge of Kentucky. So the Democratic Party has two nominees, Breckinridge representing the southern wing of the Democratic Party and Stephen Douglas representing the northern wing of the Democratic Party. And into Chicago comes the Republican Party. We, we are going to win this election and we're gonna win it big. The Democrats are feuding. They've drawn blood among each other. And in, into, into Chicago came the front runner with a bushel basket full of delegates. And all he needed was a couple of dozen more delegates and he's over the top. And that was one of the founders of the brand new Republican Party. And that was William Seward of New York. And he was the darling of the Republican Party. He's the front runner. He came in with deep pockets, a lot of money to spread around. What's new, huh? He came in with a lot of patronage to spread around as well. And the mission, the mission was to derail him and to prevent him from getting a first ballot nomination. And that's the work of the Lincoln people. And the Lincoln people, in looking for a way to damage Seward and to prevent a first ballot nomination, they got the goods on Seward. Something fell out of his mouth, similar to Romney. Things are falling out of his mouth all the time, aren't they? And, and Seward said two words in a speech. They're all things we wish we had never said before. Things fall out of our mouths all the time. Ask Joe Biden. It happens to him all the time as well, doesn't it? And the, the Lincoln Wide Awakes found two words that Seward had said in a speech. And they highlighted them in the yellow highlighter, passed the speech around. I'm exaggerating to make a point. Do you want to nominate a man who said this? You ready for these two words? That, he's, that Seward said, I see an irrepressible conflict coming between the North and the South. Two words, irrepressible conflict. Do we want to nominate a man who is predisposed to war? 
Do we want to nominate a man who, in the 3 a.m. of his soul, thinks an irrepressible conflict is coming between the North and the South? Do you want to risk that? Or do you wish to support Abraham Lincoln, who has not made any foolish statements like that? What say you? And the, the Lincoln wide awakes, moving among the delegates and laying this out, we're going to win this election, but maybe not with William Seward talking about an irrepressible conflict. The nation is close to breaking already. I mean, they've been talking secession for years, and now it looks as if we might be at the tipping point. And do you want to risk war with William Seward? So on that first ballot, bang, he doesn't get the nomination. Seward felt it slipping away from him. We've all had that experience, haven't we? You feel something slipping away from you at town meeting, or maybe you're before the judge, right? And, and you knew you're, you're gonna do time this time, right? And, and you know what's slipping away. And what Seward does to try to mend the fence quickly is that he offers Lincoln the number two spot. And the word from Chicago to Springfield, you've been offered the number two spot. Lincoln, absolutely not. I've got Seward on the run. The taste is in my mouth a little bit, and I've always wanted to be someone. Lincoln, Lincoln never talked about his past. His past was a foreign country to him. I don't want, I, I never wanted my father's life to be illiterate and to spend my days walking behind a mule, if you will, guiding a plow. You know, I want, I want a reputation. I want to be important. I want to be successful. I do not want my father's life. He did not attend his father's funeral. They were deeply estranged. His dad was simply jealous of him and wanted my son to be just like me. Lincoln, I want more than this. I'm heading out to Illinois and to reboot, restart my life. And here the word has come to Springfield. The number two slot is yours. No, work the delegations, but don't give anything away. They did, they did anyway. I'm here, here comes the, if you will, the, you know, the, the click, click, click from the Telegraph from Springfield. Don't promise anything. Don't give anything away. And the word back to Lincoln, you bet. And the word on the floor was give everything away. Give cabinet slots away. So to Seward, the front runner, I think Barack Obama must have read that story. Just as Secretary of State Hillary Clinton was his primary challenger, William Seward and the delegates of New York, your man will be my Secretary of State. To, from others, to, well, it will be, it will be the, 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 another man whose name was put in nomination from Ohio, uh, Sam and Chase, he'll get the, tr the treasury. What do you want for the delegates? I'll take the treasury, you got it. Uh, Cameron of Pennsylvania, what do you want? I'll take the Secretary of War, you've got it. Bates of M Maryland, what do you want? I'll take Postmaster General, you've got it. And Lincoln, plausible deniability. I said, don't do anything like that. See, all guys like plausible deniability. I never said that. I never promised that. I was misquoted. I don't use that kind of language. Lincoln, don't make any promises. Make promises, all right? Make promises. I need the delegate, I, I need the votes. And it will be Ohio, Sam and Chase, Ohio. You know, Ohio, Ohio proudly casts its delegates for the next president of the United States, Abraham Lincoln. And on the third ballot, Lincoln goes over the top and on the third ballot, Lincoln offers the vice presidency to nobody from nowhere, Hannibal Hamlin of Maine. And so what do we have here? We have the Democratic Party having two candidates, the Republican Party is unified, and we have a fourth party, just to complicate matters. And that fourth party is the Constitutional Union Party, stressing the Constitution and stressing union. And to, to show the notion of constitution and union, John Bell of Tennessee, slaveholder, is at the top of the ticket, and the number two guy from the great state of Massachusetts, a man who, about whom we know very little, I'm sure you've never heard of this guy's name, Ed Everett. Ed Everett was the number two guy on the ticket. In 1860, though, people knew the name, in the North anyway, they knew the name Ed Everett. Go up the expressway. The exit number 15 is the Ed, Eddie Everett, it's not Eddie, is the Edward Everett cutoff. Edward Everett was well known in Massachusetts. He had been governor, had been senator, 
had been ambassador to Great Britain, had been, vice, had been, had been secretary of war, the, had served on the, had been president of Harvard College, had a voice, and he was known for dedication, dedicating monuments, Bunker Hill, Plymouth Rock, I think Plymouth Rock, the Mount Vernon, the Minuteman statue up in, the, up in Concord. He had the voice, the pace, and the diction. It was Ed Everett, we've mentioned this earlier, who gave the Gettysburg Address. If you open up the program for, for November 1863, the, next to the Gettysburg Address, the, if you will, the benediction, the first national secretary, is the name Ed Everett. And next to Lincoln's name is the word remarks. We have to invite the president. No one wanted to invite him. It's Lincoln's words that are remembered, not the two and a half hour monologue of Ed Everett. So people knew Ed Everett and what the Constitutional Union Party hoped to do. They knew they could not carry a national election, but they were trying to slow down the race maybe toward war. That if we can, if we can siphon off enough electoral votes, and throw it to the House of Representatives, perhaps people will cool down and we'll have a compromise presidency, not a compromise presidency, that will have a different slate, president and vice president, and be able to duck possibly the drift or the headlong rush to civil war. That was their goal. So Lincoln and Hamlin, and there's no national campaign. I mean, Lincoln, people did not campaign the way they campaign today. I mean, there were no buttons and rallies and, and, and debates and so forth. And, and here is Lincoln, the taste is in my mouth a little bit. And on election day, as the tallies came in across the country, came in by telegraph, and Walter Cronkite with 2% of the vote, we are now calling the election for Abraham Lincoln. That never happened. I can fantasize anything. You know, since it's happened in the past, I can always rewrite it and make it up that Lincoln, Lincoln did not carry a single vote, a single state below the Mason-Dixon line. And maybe that's because his name wasn't even on the ballot. We, how about that? His name not even on the ballot. We, don't want, we do not even want to give folks in the South an opportunity, maybe, to vote for Lincoln. A lot of folks wanted out. Let it come now. Let's engage secession now. Lincoln, remember the, the magic number was 152. The Lincoln-Hamlin ticket, 180 electoral votes, without a single Southern vote. And if you, even if you combine the electoral vote of the Northern wing of the party, the Democratic Party, and the Southern wing, and the Constitutional Union Party, the number is 123. And the, so they're not even close, even if the Democratic Party had not split. So it's that they combine 123, Lincoln is a sectional president. He's been elected by the North, no doubt about it. The press has descended on Springfield, and Mary, of course, just enjoys this because she, she just wanted to be at the top of her voice and, and recommending people for cabinet positions and the position of my husband on certain issues. She was a woman who, well, as Winston Churchill sometimes said of Eleanor Roosevelt, did not know her place, that uh, Mary Todd Lincoln wanted to be her, number, her husband's number one advisor. And she had been in Illinois. But remember that he was a one-term congressman, had never served in the Senate. And now he's going to the big time. He's going to the major leagues. And Mary, and Mary found herself elbowed aside by the big boys in Washington, D.C. These are the heavy hitters. These are the men of the Republican Party. And, and this is why Mary, who was always high-strung, fragile, really got in, in trouble with spending, her untreated diabetes, uh, her, her bipolar, and her problems with OCD. And when Lincoln could no longer ground her, she started spending money. And boy, did she spend a lot of money. And as First Lady, she had an unlimited credit line at any store she walked into because obviously her credit is good here. You are being bankrolled by the United States of America. But that's another story for another time. But boy, could she spend money. And when it looked like maybe Lincoln was not going to be reelected re in 1864, she said, oh, wow, Lincoln's going to find out. She always called him Lincoln. 
He's going to find out and there's going to be hell to pay when all those bills come due. And now we have to pay up. And she spent money. We know that. She didn't know that yet. So in Springfield, I mean, here she is, you know, being lionized by the press. And at Springfield, the one, the one concern that she had, not one, but of the, that really bothered her, and, and Lincoln tried to keep it from her, is that to Springfield, to, 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 their, to their home, came gifts. And these were salted and smoked beets. And these were jellied fruits and so forth that came to the home. And they, had, they, were, and they bore the, the zip codes from Alabama and Mississippi and Virginia. I'm making that up. There were no zip codes. But they were coming from states below the Mason-Dixon line. And as Lincoln's supporters began to unwrap them and check them, many of them were poisoned. They were full of arsenic. They were poisoned. And Mary, who would want to poison us, Lincoln? And Lincoln's saying, oh, Mary, there's nothing to that story. It's a rumor. And all these things were burned or thrown in the, sh thrown in the river. And because Lincoln is concerned about this. And as a family, this is so human, and it never gets in the history books. As a family, they needed to make a number of decisions. What are we going to do about the house? Mary wanted to sell it. Just sell the house. Lincoln said, we can't sell the house. Mary, we built this house. You delivered our four children up in those bedrooms. We can't sell this house. We're coming home, you know, after, after, after my presidency, our presidency. This is our home. Our children were born here. What I would like to do is to rent it, you know, put our furniture in storage and to rent it for 350 bucks a year. And that was the decision. This is our home. We built it. We're coming home. Perfect, isn't it? His law partner, Billy Hurden, who Mary could not stand because Billy Hurton was a rival. Billy Hurton was a rival for Lincoln's attention, and she wanted him to herself. He kept her grounded. He really did. And, and, often, and sometimes she was annoyed with him because he did not pay enough attention to her. And, but she, she, she knew that he, was his, that he was her northern star. And Billy Hurton said to Lincoln, should I, take your, should I take your shingle down? And he said, Billy, keep it up. Hurden and Lincoln. And when I come back, we'll go back into law practice again. The children wanted to bring the dog with them to Washington, D.C. I'm not making this up. The dog's name was Fido, F-I-D-O. And there's a photograph of it. You can bring it up online. The Gettysburg Museum has a photograph of Fido, a mangy cur, on the horsehair couch. And the decision is we're not taking the dog to Washington. What we'll do is, boys, is we'll give the dog to the boys next door that you play with. And when we come back, we'll take the dog back. And to make the dog happy, we'll, give, we'll move over this horsehair couch that the dog sleeps on over to the neighbors. The, those boys will watch the dog. And we, when we come home, the couch comes back. The dog comes back. We're in this house. I'm down the street you know, working at the law again. And, and we'll just go into retirement. Now, we know the end of that story, don't we? But it's such a human story that getting ready to leave and pack up and not knowing you know, what is on the other end of that 1,100-mile train ride to Washington, D.C. And we know the Civil War is coming. And back then, back then, the inaugurals were in March, not in January. So there was a five-month hiatus between the election in November and Lincoln taking office in March. And that will not change until Franklin Roosevelt in 1936. So in the Constitution, by the way, this is Constitution Week, isn't it? And Monday was Constitution Day. Um, it was signed 225 years ago. Don't leave home without it. Whenever I get arrested, all I have to do is bring this out of my inside pocket, and you're free to go, sir. You're free to go. Right? It, it, it's a charm. It's an absolute charm. And whenever I'm out somewhere and the conversation begins to lag, you know, you're at a reception or you're at a, you're at a funeral or wake or, or you're at a, a party, and all I need to do is to bring this out. People tip over chairs and tables to get to where I'm seated to be able to talk about the Constitution. It's electric. It's excitement. 
I tell that to my students. They begin rolling their eyes and slamming their heads on their desks. And I say, no, when things slow down, bring out the Constitution. I said, it is absolutely a game changer. I said, guys, this is a pickup document. You can meet so many women just by pulling this out of your pocket. It's like catnip. I said, that's the secret. Carry the Constitution with you. Now, they all think that I'm really mentally ill, that I need to be medicated and tied to a gurney, which is fine. I'll accept that. So, so the Lincolns, the Lincolns have made these decisions. They're packing up. They're going to head to Washington. Lincoln is working on his inaugural address. And in December of 1860, South Carolina, South Carolina is the first state out of the Union. We secede. And who's with us? Y'all, gonna, who's going to join us in secession to create a new nation? And just a word about this, I, I, I would be remiss if I overlooked it, that secession is lawful, they argue, that there is nothing in the Constitution that prohibits secession. And they're right. There is nothing in the Constitution that prohibits secession. And even Lincoln agreed. He said, you're absolutely right. There is nothing in the Constitution that prohibits you from leaving because when our grandfathers wrote this Constitution, they thought no one would ever want to leave. Why would you ever want to leave me or us? You've got the best deal in the world. And because they thought nobody would ever want to leave, they wrote in language, I keep pointing to this, they wrote in language in which territories were formed, they wrote state territorial constitutions, and then they were admitted as a state without any probation. So the great state of Illinois, when it was admitted to the Union, uh, when admitted to the Union, 1818, 1890, came in without any, pro, uh, any, any wait time that they were the equal of a Massachusetts or a Virginia, you know, the founding colonies. They saw the nation as expanding, not contracting. Of course there's no language to leave. Who would ever want to leave? This is the best deal in town. You're right. You're absolutely right. So any clever lawyer can move the conversation around, and that's Lincoln. South Carolina is out. Who's with us? You know, and, and when South Alabama, Alabama, we're in Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, and by February of 1861, Lincoln's not even sworn in yet, by February of 1861, the gravest constitutional crises in the nation flowed out of those election returns. And, it, and the, only sec, the only crisis that, that even comes close is the Great Depression of 1929 and the importance of the 1932 election as to how are we going to treat these problems. This 1860, 1861, the gravest constitutional crisis in the Union. Lincoln's got seven states out of the Union. There are eight more slave states, and what he, is he going to do? They meet in Montgomery, Alabama, and they form the Confederate States of America. And, and by the way, on the floor, you know, what are we going to call ourselves? And initially, the, one, one of the recommendations was the Confederation of Washington, that this is our 1776, and we are rebelling away from Abraham Lincoln the first. And what we are simply doing is modeling the behavior of our grandparents, of our grandfathers, when they rebelled against George the first, that tyrant. This is not the nation our grandfathers created. We are no longer safe here. Our property is going to be, is in peril. We are leaving peaceably. Don't chase me. You know, don't, don't hang out where I, you know, where I, uh, where I take my, my meals. You know how that is, right? Where I work and you park next to me and wait for me to come out of work. We're done. Lose my phone number, right? We're done. And this is the seven states. We're done. The Confederate States of America. They sent ambassadors abroad. They sent ambassadors to William James Buchanan, President of the United States. And he said, please, please, no, no, give them to Lincoln. I'm leaving. As he said to Lincoln, you, sir, if you're as happy upon being president as I am in leaving, you are a happy man. Uh, I, boy, not on my watch. I don't want to start anything. This is, this is the hot potato on your inbox right from the beginning. Confederate States of America, President and Vice President, Jefferson Davis, uh, Verena Howell Davis was his wife, not Virginia, Verena, with a constitution which, by the way, said nobody can leave. 
It prohibited secession. Don't you love it? It prohibited secession. Raise an army, send ambassadors abroad, seize federal property, and we're ready to go. And we know, don't we, that waiting in the wings is the, is the smoldering crisis at Fort Sumter. So Lincoln is making his way to Washington, D.C. Seven states are out. Eight other slave states are teetering on the brink, possibly, of secession. And what is this president going to say? The, what is he going to say here? And when Lincoln arrived in Washington, as you well know, that he had to change trains in Baltimore and go into Washington in disguise. And the reason for that is that there was a real threat of assassination in, 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 in D.C. And when he changed trains, he went in, he went in, in disguise into Washington the, at night. And the Southern press picked this up. See how illegitimate this man is? He knows he's a fraud. He knows he's a phony. He knows he does not represent we the people. He knows he's a liar. And he's had to sneak into Washington in disguise because he is illegitimate and that's why we've left. He's a liar and his mouth, his tongue does not know the truth. And where do you hear that inaugural? He's going to lay it all out. And, and we will be joined by eight more slave states. And I know that. We are, we are modeling our grandfathers who in 1776 called out George III and were doing the very same, the same thing, 1860, 1861. These were hot times. I mean, these were guys who were itching for a fight. And they're going to get it. They're going to get it at Fort Sumter. And that's why they, it's the war of northern aggression, isn't it? That we left peaceably and you came after us. We left and you started. You threw the first punch at Fort Sumter. I'm talking like I'm from Mississippi. And I'm from Illinois, so I can say that. You know, I got stopped one time in a, in a far and distant galaxy when I was much younger, when I knew everything, you know. At 20 and 21, I got stopped in Tennessee. I had a Chicago plate on, I had an Illinois plate on, Landa Lincoln. I got stopped in Tennessee for running, who knows, a stop sign. You didn't stop. <laughs> Maybe I did, maybe I did. And then I get pulled over, and the cop comes up, and he just he came up, and he just looked at me, and the first thing he said, Landa Lincoln, huh? He saw the plate, Landa Lincoln. I said, man, I'm going to get written up, I know that, and I got written up. <laughs> All he said was, just looked at me, Landa Lincoln, huh? So, what are you going to do? I lost that one from the beginning, didn't I? So. Lincoln moving in, getting, getting to Washington, D.C. And in that inaugural, Stephen Douglas, who was in attendance at that inaugural, did not believe Lincoln would finish it alive. And the, if you will, the uh, General Winfield Scott, today, well, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, there was no Joint Chiefs of Staff, but his title was General in Chief, that he was so concerned about the, the security in Washington, D.C. The rumors, I mean, the rumors were all over the Capitol that Lincoln's going to be shot down at some point during the inaugural. And what, what, what Winfield Scott did is he had sharpshooters in all the windows, you know, watching the crowd, sharpshooters on the rooftops. Artillery was brought up right to the very front of the inaugural platform with the gun barrel painted out, not painted, pointed out, because the word on the street, and, and Scott had, had agents everywhere, and the word in the bar rooms, the word in the hotel parlors, is Lincoln will not finish the speech alive. That's then, that's certainly what Stephen Douglas believed. And Douglas sat there holding Lincoln's hat, because when Lincoln got up to speak, he had no place to hold his hat, and Douglas got up and said, I'll hold it for you, Mr. President. So there is Douglas waiting for the gunshot. And imagine you're, you're, you're walking out and you're standing on the edge of the platform. You have no protection. It's very different days. You have a hostile crowd, some of whom maybe wish you are dead right then. And what is this man going to say? And Lincoln, in that inaugural, 35 minutes, laid out a number of carrots and sticks. All right, carrots and sticks. The carrots, the carrots. I am not going to tackle slavery where it exists. Carrot. My word is my bond, spoken and written. I am not going to go after slavery where it exists. That's the carrot. 
Uh, I'm not coming in. I will not invade you. That's the carrot. Stick. Stick. The union is perpetual. You have no right, stick. You have no right to break it up simply because you have lost an election. You can vote me out in 1864. Stick. That I am going to protect federal property. He did not say how. I am going to protect federal property. I am a lawfully elected president. I've just taken an oath to my God and our God to preserve and, def and protect and defend the nation, so help me God. And I'm going to do that. And in that, in that inaugural, you know, Lincoln did not condemn the Sessures. I mean, he knew they're called Sessures. He knew he had to govern them. You know, but I'm president of all the people. And at the end, you know, at the end, almost in a naive way, and he wasn't being naive, he was hopeful. You see, he did not believe that these seven states were really going to stay outside the Union. He did not. They're angry. They've lost an election. They've stomped out. You know, like we've had a fight. You've stomped out. You'll be back. And I'm going to leave the nightlight on, the front door unlocked, and I'm going to put up a meal for you in the refrigerator. I know you'll be home. And I'm not going to ask where you've been, who you've been with, or, or what you've been up to. Get home here now. And Lincoln expected that once they got over it and that he did not invade and abolish slavery and did, no, and did nothing to, to antagonize and inflame the situation, that one by one that they would come back and it, it would be as if I didn't even know you were gone. Oh, there you are, Alabama. I missed you at the inaugural. You must have been busy. You must have missed your flight. I know. There, ah, there you are, South Carolina. They'll be home. I'm not going to ask what, where you've been and that Lincoln was not trying to inflame a situation that was already at a critical mass. His first day in the office, first full day, he doesn't even know where the men's room is, and his first full day, bang, into the inbox comes a, comes a telegram from Major Robert Anderson at Fort Sumter. I'm running out of food. The merchants in Charleston will no longer trade with me. They want me to surrender the fort. What should I do? Should I strike the colors? Please advise. And Lincoln, I, we can only imagine, Virginia's still in the Union, right? And I, I'm sorry, I'm, Virginia, Virginia's still in, still in the Union. South Carolina's out. They want that fort because out in, out, out in Charleston Harbor, that fort is Yankee cannon, Yankee soldiers, Yankee flag. We want that fort. We want, to we want to change the U to a C. It now belongs to Confederate States of America. Give up the fort. And Anderson, they won't sell. I'm running out of food. They're threatening to attack me. Please advise, shall I strike the colors? And Lincoln calling a cabinet meeting. And the, the advice is, and the advice from William Seward, who thought that he would be Lincoln's mentor in matters of foreign policy, surrender the fort buy time, don't start anything yet, or at all, surrender the fort, buy time, and organize your administration. You're 24 hours into the job. And in fact, the majority of the cabinet recommended that, that Fort Sumter cannot be properly defended or properly resupplied. And Lincoln said, I'm not going to do that. I just ran an election. I just won an election saying I'm going to protect and defend federal property. And if the tug has to come now, it's going to come now. And what Lincoln does is he sets up Jefferson Davis. It's a beautiful trap. Lincoln brings war to South Carolina. And what Lincoln does, very cleverly, is that I am going to resupply Fort Sumter with food. There'll be no munitions, no soldiers, no cannon. That is federal property. And I just, took, I just told you that I'm going to protect federal property. You cannot seize it. So I'm going to send ships, supply ships, to Fort Sumter. There are 80, 85 men there. So Major Anderson, hold your ground. Do not strike the colors. Help is on the way. And Lincoln also did this. He sent a telegram to Governor Pickens of South Carolina. Governor Pickens, 
that you can expect su supply ships on these t April, uh, April 12th, April 13th, April 14th, depending on the winds, depending on, on the tides, if you will. You can expect three supply ships to resupply Fort Sumter. There'll be no soldiers, no cannon, no, no munitions. Pickens gets this. He said, boy, this is above my pay grade. I don't make enough money to make this call. He sends it down to Jeff Davis. You know, what should I do? And Davis, who is a West Point guy, knows exactly what's up here. If I allow Lincoln to resupply that fort, it, 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 it takes the wind out of the sails of secession. And Lincoln, if he, re if, I, if he allows me to resupply that fort, it takes the wind out of secession, doesn't it? If he starts anything, I have the moral high ground that he started it. Davis knows that. I have to take that fort or it makes all of this just empty camped and we're whining and we're really not the independent Confederate States of America. The word goes back up to Pickens. When those ships show up, fire on those ships, commence firing on that, on, on that fort. And the man in charge of the cannon, the man in charge of the artillery in Charleston, South Carolina, was General Beauregard. And the reason I mention his name is that Beauregard was a West Pointer. And Beauregard, Beauregard was such a, an apt pupil that Major Robert Anderson, who was the artillery instructor at West Point and was Beauregard's artillery instructor, asked him to stay on after he graduated to help train the new group of plebes coming in. That's how good he was. Here's where the, the student exceeds the teacher. And that's a great day, isn't it? That you have taken what I've given you and you have just run with it. Beauregard does not want to fire on his teacher. You were my professor at West Point. You taught me everything, and I and I and because of you, this is I'm, I'm now in. I, I'm wearing butternut gray, you know. But but I'm but but I I don't want to fire on you. And Beauregard rows out, and he tells Anderson, "I've got I've got orders in the morning at daybreak to fire on you. I don't want to do that. Evacuate the fort. You have my word." that you will be able to leave peaceably and safely. And Anderson said, General Beauregard, I have my orders, and my orders are not to surrender the fort. Talk about a standoff. I mean, talk about, talk about a, a, a conflict here. Talk about cognitive dissonance, right? You have to do something you know is wrong. I'm going to fire on my professor, and, I'm, and everything is going to start right here at daybreak, on this day, at this hour when dawn first begins to streak across that eastern skyline and those ships show up and they get driven off and for 33 or 35 hours Fort Sumter 4,000 shells are fired at Fort Sumter and it is taken down brick by brick by brick. What you visit today is a rebuilt Sumter. It was taken down brick by brick. The soldiers are in the cellar and finally, finally Anderson strikes the colors, and he's able to leave peaceably and returning to Kentucky, where he's from. And the war is on. And with the attack on Fort Sumter, four more states leave the Union. Virginia's out. North Carolina is out. Virginia, North Carolina, Arkansas, and Tennessee, both the Union. So now we've gone from 7 to 11, and there are four more slave states still in the Union. Maryland, which surrounds Washington, D.C., Maryland, Missouri, Kentucky, and Delaware. We tend to forget that Delaware was a slave state. It had few slaves, but now, now we're down to four. And as Lincoln always said, I hope that God is on my side. He was not a religious person. He was not even baptized. I hope that God is on my side, but I have to have Kentucky. And of course, if I leave Maryland, we're going to have to relocate the, the capital to Philadelphia, maybe to New York. And that, and there's a whole other piece I have, Lincoln's Constitution and the way he read the Constitution during the crisis of the Civil War, taking broad liberties in suspending the free press, locking people up without the benefit of habeas corpus, waging war without a declaration of war, because if I ask for a declaration of war, only nations can declare war each other, against each other, and if I ask for a declaration of war, it, it indicates that the Confederacy is an independent nation. They are not. They are in rebellion. And this is Lincoln, a clever, astute, 
politician, statesman, and attorney. And any good attorney can argue both sides of a case. You know that. And, and, Lincoln, and now the war is on. I've got four more states out of the Union. And Maryland is looking to leave. And that's why he promptly declared martial law in Maryland, shut down the newspapers, and arrested what later on became known as Copperheads. And these were Democrats who were supporting secession in a Union state of Maryland. So lock down Maryland, martial law, I can't lose Maryland either. Other word, otherwise, we have to relocate the, the entire government. And Lincoln? calling Congress back in a special session on July 4th, 1861. Perfect, isn't it? Congress went home in, after the inaugural. They weren't to convene again until December. Back then, it was a part-time job with full-time pay. I like it. Part-time job, it still is today. Full-time job, um, part-time job, full-time pay. I'm calling everybody back in a special session, July 4th, 1861. I've got four states out of the Union. Maryland is teetering on the brink of leaving. I'm declaring martial law, and I'm asking Congress, I need, I need 75,000 soldiers for 90 days to put this down. Calling on the states to supply 75,000 so soldiers. There was an eagle scream of patriotism across the money. Men signing up. Massachusetts, the Massachusetts, Massachusetts sent some of the first troops you know, in Washington, D.C. The first casualty, the first death of the Civil War was a Massachusetts man passing through Baltimore attack, attacked by mobs and there was a big shootout between armed mobs and, and Massachusetts state militia moving to the Capitol. And the first fatality was a Massachusetts man. By the way, tonight on Channel 2, there is a, a piece by, by Faust, um, what's her name? Uh, uh, Faust, the president, Drew. Drew, yeah, Drew Gilpin Faust on, on Civil War and Death and Dying in the Civil War. It's a great book. I've used her book in class, and she does a nice job in, in, in talking about whatever, and talking about how war there was to be for 90 days. Lincoln called out the troops for 90 days, and after the first bull run, it really sobered up Lincoln, and now we called for 300,000 soldiers for three years. And this is going to be a royal battle, isn't it? And that's, that's a whole course. That's 15 weeks on the Civil War. And so here we have the war, uh, the Civil War, or the war between the states, or the war of northern aggression. And, and depending on what side of the, whether you're wearing you know, butternut or, or, or federal blue, you know, whether Lincoln caused the war or was simply living up to his promise to defend the Union and protect federal property. And I'll close with this. In his inaugural address, he used the word union 20 times, which suggests a compact of states, a union. You can break a union. And after Gettysburg, it was nation. We are a nation, not a union. We are a nation. And at Gettysburg, explaining to those folks why this civil war has come about to preserve the nation, a nation of people. We, the people, of the people, by the people, and for the people, right, shall not perish. Only living things can perish. And that's Lincoln tying it up together between the first three words of the Constitution, coming down to the last phrases in the Gettysburg Address, and then, am I going to get reelected? Is Am I going to get reelected after all this bloodshed and Grant being stalled in front of Richmond and Sherman stalled in front of Atlanta? Am I going to get reelected? With all this bloodshed, we have not had any big wins yet, and is there going to be a change in administration to set the record straight? And, and Lincoln said, I think I'm going to get beat here because we're getting beat on the field. Grant and Sherman and Sheridan have not yet delivered, and I need another term to make it happen. Sounds contemporary, doesn't it? And I think I'm going to get beat. So let me stop here. That's our 1860 election. It's so vibrant, isn't it? There's so much there. And the story tells itself. All you need to do is keep it straight in your head. I mean, it tells itself. And the psychological importance for Sumter, both to Lincoln and to Jefferson Davis, Lincoln knowing it, Davis knowing it, and that's the flashpoint. That's the, that's the neuralgia point for the war. Right there, Fort Sumter, April, April of, of 1861. When Fort Sumter was reclaimed by the North, Major Anderson returned and ran up the very same flag 
that he had run down on four years to the very day. Lincoln was invited to attend, to be there, but he was not. He had tickets to the theater, four tickets to the theater on that very day to see a comedy, our American, uh, what's our, our, our American cousin. And he's at, he's at Ford's Theater rather than at Fort Sumter to witness the, 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 the flag being raised over Fort Sumter. Again, the very flag Anderson had, had taken down when he surrendered the fort. I mean, history, you can't make that up. Hollywood can't write that. I mean, that's just the way life unfolds. It's like our lives. You can't write it, you live it. You live it day to day. And you wonder what's gonna happen on, from Monday to Friday. And that's the beauty of it. And that's the magic of it and the mystery of it. And that's why it's great to get up in the morning and get going. What can I help you with before I, before I dash off? Anything at all? Yes, sir. We're leaving this Friday to go to Chattanooga to visit our daughter. And throughout Chattanooga, there are lots of statues facing the north. Sure. And they tell you we never turn our back on our enemy. Mm -hmm. 150 years later. They right. Still say that. Right. Absolutely. And and Tennessee is the home state of Andrew Johnson, which was Lincoln's second vice president for lots of reasons why he chose him in 1864. It used to be, I always thought, and, and that all northern statues looked southward to keep an eye on the south. And when I heard that, and somebody told me that, I said, I've never heard that. And I checked around, and the first four, four or five that I found, they were all looking south. And then I found some that weren't. All right, so that killed that. But I, I, I would like to believe that there's some, some folks did when they put them up in Easton or, or maybe here, I don't know, facing south to always keep an eye on the south in defeat, that Dixie will not rise again. Was yes, there sir? any dissent in the south prior to the war? Pardon me? Was there a dissent in the south? Oh, absolutely. The regarding secession? Absolutely. I mean, you don't hear of it. It's I know you do. Very unified, right. Very... Not at all. Not at all. There was great dissent. And it was the planter aristocracy that organized they these. Were uh, they were, and they ran the, and there were secession conventions. There, yeah, these, these, this decision was not through the legislature of South Carolina or Alabama. There were secession conventions to secede, just like there were separate conventions to ratify the Constitution, rather than having it going through the various state legislatures. Absolutely, there was a huge minority that did not support the war. When the initial flush of, of the war passed, and it became a shooting war and a dying war, the, the amount of, I mean, desertions on both sides were pretty high. And after 1864, with Lincoln's re-election, even Lee said, I'm losing 8% a week. My soldiers going home, you know, because my wife needs me at home. There are, there are Yankees all over the place. Absolutely, you never hear of it. It's like, it's a monolithic support. In the North, there were copperheads. And that's why Lincoln had to shut the press down, throw people in jail, suspend habeas corpus, declare martial law in, 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 in Maryland you know, to, keep, to, keep the, to keep things under control here. And you have to do that. You can't be a Democrat, and I mean Democrat with a small d, in the middle of a civil war. I mean, you have to, you have to, you have to shoot people sometimes. You have to take care of business, otherwise you lose everything. Thank you, you're absolutely right. So, say hello to Chattanooga. <laughs> Chattanooga was the, it's a capital, right? No, no Chattanooga, no, all right, Chattanooga was, all right, Ch Knoxville was the first Confederate capital to fall. Chattanooga, when Chattanooga fell, that was a major gunpowder producer for the Confederacy. And they were always, you know, now we've got to find another source of gunpowder. Good story, great story, such a human story. And are you familiar with the short story writer Ambrose Bierce? Read his stuff. Uh, he served in the Civil War, and then he simply disappeared into Mexico. And, but Ambrose Bierce's, Am, Ambrose Bierce's short stories, they're dark, they're dark, and they're ominous, and it's about the threat of war. And sometimes I'll, I'll sign a few of them and just to look for a common theme. I like to use literature in class and in artwork and poetry. I like the eclectic approach. You know, it's, it's, you know, and tell the story from the bottom up. But you have to tell Lincoln from the top down. I mean, he's 6'4". I mean, how can you not tell it from the top down? And Mary, you can tell from the bottom up, because she's only 5'2". And there are no photographs of Lincoln and Mary standing together, because she was so conscious of the height disparity. They're seated, but they're not standing. Right? 
because there's such a, a height disparity. And that's why she wanted no part of Stephen Douglas when he came courting. You're too short. You're 5'2". And she went in the other direction, 6'4", and a guy that wore a 14 size shoe and had Marfan's condition. He had, finger, he had fingers like asparagus. I mean, his toes were like pieces of baby corn. So he's a big guy. And I can imagine him the night, the day, the week they were married, there were no king size beds. Now, here's a big guy that I'm sure Mary was hanging onto the edge because he's full of kneecaps and elbows, all right? You know? <laughs> I'm sure she was hanging on the edge of that bed, but I married my guy. All right? I got my guy. I nailed him. So, anything else? Yes, please. I'm intrigued with Mary Todd Lincoln's issue, medical issues. Were those diagnoses made later? Oh, years and years later. Oh, yeah. All right. I mean, imagine. Imagine untreated diabetes. No one knew the condition, and it's untreated. And she's bipolar. Her mood swings were enormous. And as she grew older and felt more isolated, they became even more pronounced. And then her children dying on her. You know, um, you know Eddie in Springfield and Willie in the White House. And Tad at 18 when she left the White House after her man died. Her love could not protect Abraham Lincoln. I mean, his Blood was all, all over her. And I can imagine Jacqueline Kennedy. I mean, she never got over that moment. My husband's blood is all over me. Like that, he's talking and laughing, and bang, he's dead. Just, you know, and not that you're ready for it. You're not never ready for an assassination. And with the war over, and Mary hopeful that we can get our marriage back together again, it really had leached away. Uh, it, it, had, it, had, it had completely eroded. And, and Mary, maybe now we can, get our marriage back together again. And then, then came you know, Ford's Theater, and, 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 and Mary never recovered from that emotionally. Never, ever, ever got over that. With all the other deaths, never got over that. And fragile to begin with. It's a good story. Do we ever do that here? No. I've never done, I've, I have a piece called First Ladies of the Civil War. And it's Farina Howell Davis, the first and only uh, First Lady of the Confederacy, and Mary Todd Lincoln and their experiences. The war goes to the background, and Mary and Verena Howell Davis come to the foreground. But obviously, you need to tell the story in the context of the war. It's like talking about Eleanor Roosevelt and not me mentioning Franklin. I mean, you can't separate them out. They were Mr. and Mrs. New Deal, weren't they? I mean, no matter what their relationship was, or came to be, to the country, they were a team, Mr. and Mrs. New Deal. And that's a story. <laughs> Hoo hoo, that's a story, right? You know, the, you know, that's days of our lives, desperate housewives. That's a story. So I'll see you soon. When are we meeting again? Yes, um, October 3rd. Hear that? October 3rd. That's the day of the debate. The night of the debate. The first debate. Right. So that'll be a good night. We're meeting and then we can enjoy the debate. That's right. Excellent. What's our, uh, what, which election are we doing? Well, it's in my, it's in my calendar. Don't laugh. At it. It's in my calendar. Well, October 3rd was supposed to be Lincoln and today was supposed to be the um, Hale to the Chief Electoral College. Well, when I saw that, the election of 1860, I said, that's what we're talking about. Because I'm sorry. <laughs> so we'll do Hail to the Chief October 3rd. Okay, okay, okay. You know, I watched it. I thought I was doing Hail to the Chief. And then I saw that. I said, I guess I'm doing Lincoln. I can, I can move like that. Right? I can shift gears like that. I'm impressed. I, me too. I used to be a running back for the NFL. I can shift gears all over the place. Okay, so we'll do. All right. Why didn't you stop me? Well, because you were. I didn't know how easily. Oh, I can. Oh, I can shift gears like that. Listen, my children never had a photograph of their father. All they had was a composite drawing. All right. I was always on the move. All right. So, oh, that's a great story. Sorry. We'll tell it another day. Well, we'll tell it another day. That's all. We'll tell it another time. Yeah. yeah. Go to the high schools. You know, mm -hmm. go there and, t and teach. And I've teach. always felt you got to get students young. Yeah. You have to get them even younger than that because students do not like history, and it's so hard to get boys to read history. And it's a great story, and it tells well, and it reads well. You, that, it's it's a great story. It's a people story. And when you can bring in the little vignettes and give it some snap, crackle, and pop. It just enlivens, doesn't it? I mean, can't you see 
Can't you see them sitting down, the Lincolns? Do we rent or sell? What about the dog? And, and the kids cranking about the dog? And should I take my shingle down and this poison fruit showing up? How am I going to get that past Mary and tell her, don't worry about it? It's okay. It was sent to the wrong address. It's the Lincolns on the other side of town that it was sent to. They got the wrong Lincoln household. I'll see you later. Thank you.